Are you cool? Oh. <laughs> okay, I just want to welcome everybody to the uh, open house for the Comprehensive Regional Water Plan for the Sunshine Coast Regional District. I'm uh, Brian Shioji. I'm the General Manager. As you, am I supposed to be using the mic? <laughs> of the Infrastructure Services Department with the Regional District. And thank you, everybody, for coming out. I know everybody has uh, a busy life, a busy schedule, and it's, uh, it's hard to get out to these. But this is the second of two open houses that we've had today. We had the first one at the District of Seashell, at the Seaside Center, and it was, we, it was a packed house. And uh, we're really encouraged by the interest uh, that everybody has in this subject, and we're really looking forward to a lot of feedback. Uh, the way we've structured the open house is, as you've all seen, there's a bunch of storyboards back there. And um, after the presentation, um, there's going to be time again to go back to those storyboards and ask more questions. Uh, we got a 45 minute long presentation by our consultants. And I'll, I'll introduce our consultants in a second. And um, as far as questions during the presentation, we kindly ask that you hold your questions until after the presentation. It, it is a 45 minute long presentation. There's a lot of information and each kind of slide leads into another one. So hopefully if you hold on to your questions, they'll get answered by the time the presentation's over. But if not, uh, there'll be an opportunity to ask, uh, to ask questions afterwards. As, as well uh, to um, ask, uh, there's a number of uh, SCRD staff here well, we're all wearing name tags, so track us down and ask us any specific questions that you have. And as well, we have feedback forms here that uh, we encourage you to take with you or complete here and hand in, and they're also available on our, on our website. And lastly, we are videotaping the presentation, and we will be putting up the presentation on our YouTube, on the SRD YouTube channel for uh, anybody that wasn't able to make it to one of the open houses. And so if you know anybody that wasn't able to make it, uh, please direct them to our YouTube channel and they can watch it online. And if, and it, because it is being videotaped, if you don't, I think we have a direct line uh, without capturing any heads. But if you don't want to be specifically caught on film, please let us know afterwards. And with that, I'll introduce our consultants from Opus Date and Night. <coughs> we have Gurjeet Sangha, who's the uh, vice, pre uh, vice president with uh, Opus Date and Night, and Clyde, Clyde Young, who's uh, an assistant coach engineer. So they'll do the presentation, and uh, yeah, please hold your questions to the end. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, everybody, for coming up tonight. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. We're going to be talking about the Comprehensive Regional Water Plan. Uh, it would be great to get uh, your input in, in um, completion of the plan. Just, just give you a bit of uh, history of the plan. So it was a collaborative uh, project. Uh, we had a technical team to provide input and reviewed uh, various drafts of the reports. Uh, so the technical team included the Vancouver, Co Vancouver Coastal Health with Tim Adams, the Sunshine Coast Regional District, the District of Seashell, the Town of Gibsons, and the Seashelt Indian Government District. So here's a, a quick agenda of what we'll be talking about today. I will be talking about, uh, give you a bit of background of the report. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, process. Um, our last update was in 2002. Uh, this is actually built on that last update. Um, we'll talk about some of the previous, uh, additional previous studies, the purpose of uh, the assignment process. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the regional water service area. Uh, we're gonna, we'll then move on to the keys to the comprehensive regional plan uh, and then finish off with timelines and budgets. So as I mentioned, the last, up, last update was done in 2002. Uh, there's a number of technical memorandum that uh, were completed previous to this assignment. Was done. In, four technical memorandums were done in 2007. So we did a technical memorandum to review the drought risk to Chapman Lake, which is technical memorandum number one. We also looked at uh, upgrade options for the water treatment plant. Uh, third technical memorandum was to raise the lake and look at options, including the floating pump and an engineered man-made lake. 
And the fourth technical memorandum is to look at some long-term solutions for the region. And that included looking at uh, some additional lakes. I think we looked at the Second Awe, Clohome, Rainy. Uh, we also looked at Trout Lake. So the purpose of the strategic plan, as I mentioned, it's an update to the 2002 um, plan. And we want to assess the current state of the regional water system. Uh, we want to look at the future water demands within the system and provide recommendations on how those can be met in a sustainable manner. So the process was there were four tasks undertaken in the assignment. So task one is engineering analysis. Task two is strategic planning and service level definition. Task four is 10 year capital plan. Sorry, task three is 10 year capital plan. Task four is a business plan and race development. So we've completed task one and three. Upon approval, we'll be moving to task four, which is business plan development. That's following adoption of the CRWP. So here's a illustration of the regional water service area. So it consists of Chapman and a small service area. So the regional water service area include, includes Egmont, Coquet, the Chapman system. It excludes the North Pender and South Pender systems. So North Pender and South Pender are, are done under a separate plan. So there's a separate 10 year master plan for those two areas. It includes Langdale, Soames, Grantham Landings, and Eastbourne. Okay, so the area does not include Gibsons, although water is provided to the upper areas of Gibsons. Okay? So that's the regional water system. So the primary sources, just really quick. So Chapman is the Chapman system provided, provided by Chapman Lake. Coke K, Sierra is provided by Ruby Lake. Egmont is provided by Wall Lake. Uh, and then we've got various wells. So we've got Lyondale has its own well, Soames, Grantham Landing, and Eastbourne has their own wells. Okay, so those are the primary supplies. There are some secondary supplies. Um, you've got the Gray Creek supply, which is considered a backup emergency supply. You've got the Chester well, which is Sunshine Coast uses in an emergency or during dry periods in the summer. And you've got Trout Lake, which is I believe in this region which is an emergency supply. It's only used, uh, it would only be used in emergencies. There's limited capacity in that, that system. Okay, so this slide is just to illustrate the complexities of the system. You know, there's 23,000 people, um, which is considered a, a smaller population, but the complexity is, is, is more similar to a larger type of a system. Okay, so we've got 10,600 service stations, 286 kilometers of water main, and, and you've got a large um, amount of water mains because it's, it's a long, skinny system. You've got 16 reservoirs, six pump stations, and 29 PRV stations. It is quite a complex system. <clears throat> so we'll be talking today also about small systems. Um, so when we look at the small systems, which includes, as I mentioned, Soames, Langell, Grafton Land and Eastbourne. So there are there are interconnectivities between the systems. So the Langdale Soames, Grafton Landing, they are connected to Chapman uh, and Gibsons. Uh, but the current plan is to run this, continue to run the systems independently. Okay, so there's no and there's also no plans to connect the North Pender and South Pender systems. Okay, so growth projections is a, is a key component of, of our analysis. And what we did when we reviewed growth when the, within the region is we tried to maintain consistency with your OCP. So your OCP documents for the various systems were used as guided documents in production of the overall master plan. So your OCP annual growth rate is about 1.7%. Um, this plan here uses a conservative number of about 2% here. Um, and what we also find is in, by 2036, Soames, 
point in Grantham to reach the OCP buildup. So if you reach OCP buildup, there's no additional growth. Okay, so we cap off the growth rates to your OCP. So just a quick note, actually, on the growth projections. There's, there's a lot of comments on, you know, what happens if you have specific developments within certain areas? Will the plan cover that? The answer is no. This is a guiding document for the region. Okay, so when you have significant developments proposed in certain areas, you'd have to look at those at a case-by-case -case basis. And so this is an overall review of your water supply system. Okay, so the keys to the comprehensive plan, you know, we look at two things. It's your water demand, how much water are you going to be using, and the level of service. To what level do you want to build your system? And what, what kind of risk are you willing to take in, in your operating system? Let's talk a little bit about water demand. <clears throat> so here's a slide. This looks at your average day consumption within the Chapman water system. As you can see, can you, can you actually see it? Can you see it back here? No. Okay, so the Chapman system has about 600 liters per capita per day. Okay, so what, what, we're do, what we do is we, take it, we look at the total volume of water used within that system over a year, divided by 365, and then divided by population. So you get liters per capita per day. So Chapman has about 600 liters per capita per day, which is considered high when you start reviewing that to other communities. Okay, so we, we did an assessment a lot. We looked a lot. In Nanaimo, it's about 484. Um, you know, Pitt Mountain is about 485. You do have some outliners. Um, Corporation of Dallas is about 621. But some of the things you need to know is Corporation Delta has a high agricultural use. So a lot of the greenhouses are provided water from their municipal system. So it may not be applicable in terms of a case uh, even comparison. <clears throat> so we also looked at maximum day demand. I'll, I'll talk a bit about system and level of service uh, in, in the upcoming slides here. But maximum day demand is basically the peak day. So one day, the highest usage day of your year, which is usually in your summertime. So for example, if, if your maximum day was on July 26th, what, it'd be, what this would be is the total flow for that day divided by population. So liters per capita per day again. And this becomes a real um, bearing issue. And I'll talk a bit about that. It's a design issue, maximum day demand. Anyways, the Chapman water system is about 1,250. So 1,250 liters per capita per day. Now if you compare that to other municipalities, I'm just going to go back to Nanaimo here for, for comparison, it's about 800 liters per capita per day. So, so it is quite significant. Okay, and then if you look at other districts, even, even the district of North Van, 841 liters per capita per day. And going back to the Corporation of Delta, it's about 854 liters per capita per day. So it is significant. The, the maximum day usage within the region is quite high. <clears throat> so our strategy really looks at water conservation efforts. What is the region doing for water conservation? And you've had a good program. You've had what we call in our report your existing demand management program. So it includes lawn, lawn sprinkling, low flow fixtures, education outreach, and it also included some stage three and stage four restrictions. So the program's done well, but as you can see that you're not actually meeting the targets that we think are achievable to the region. So we've, what we've proposed to the regional district is an intensive demand management program to try to, keep, try to bring these numbers in line with other comparable municipalities. What we're proposing here is Universal metering, increased water restrictions, incentive programs, and targeted education and outreach programs. And really, it's, you, you have to look at all of them when you try to increase or, or target an intensive demand management program. And the life cycle cost of the intensive demand management program is about $8.5 million. Capital costs for that program for water meters and installations is about $5.6 million. Okay, so 8.6 8 .6 million is comprised of 5.6 million capital costs 
and about three million O and M costs. Keep the acronyms down to the minimum. What's that? Three million operating and maintenance costs over the twenty-five year period. Sorry, yeah, it's over twenty-five years. Okay, so here, here's mm -hmm. some trend lines that we're looking at. So if you actually take your leaders per capita and put it on population, what's happening is you, you run into real problems within your system. We'll talk about those problems. We didn't talk about those in components, right? We're trying to We'll try to simplify the report. I know it's a real technical report. We'll try to simplify as much as we can. But I encourage you to ask questions. So you can ask us after the presentation. Uh, we'll be around to talk about any of the, the storyboards as well. <clears throat> so here's, here's the issues. Yeah, your, your average day is going up and your peak day is going up. What we're proposing to do is to implement the intensive demand management program over a number of years. Okay, so it's going to take a number of years to actually implement and to get some results. And this is what we're targeting, both average day and peak day. So average day, we're targeting a, re targeting a reduction of about 20%. Peak day, we're targeting a reduction of about 25%. <clears throat> I'm going to quickly talk about some of the things that happened in the Sunshine Coast, um, because the question came up is, is this actually achievable? So in the Sunshine Coast last year, you went to a stage three and a stage four water restriction. That's a significant issue. As a hydro hydraulic, hydraulic engineer, when we found out about it in our office, we were quite surprised that you went to a stage three and stage four. Stage, so what happens is, is stage one water restrictions in, sun, in the Sunshine Coast means that you can water morning and nights three days a week. Stage two is nights only. Stage three means no lawn sprinkling, and no washing your car. And stage four is no outside usage. Okay, so that's a, that's a very significant event. We see significant reductions when you go to these various stages. When you went from a stage one to a stage two, we saw in the order of 20% reduction in your demand usage. Okay, so, and so stage one to stage two is going from morning and nights just to nights. Okay, so there are some areas for water reduction. And when you went, actually went to stage three and four, you actually reduced your water usage by about 50%. Okay, so when you look at water conservation, um, in comparison to other municipalities that, that have metering programs, so the city of Nanaimo has full water meters, right? Mandatory water meters. Um, the city of North Vancouver has a voluntary program. Delta also has a voluntary program. Just to give you a, a, some reference on what some of the other municipalities do. Also, a maximum day comparison when you when you look at who's actually metering. So Nanaimo is metering. City of North Van voluntary. Delta is voluntary. So that's one component. Is, is one component is demand. The other component that we look at is level of service. So what is the level that you want to build your system out to? Okay. So we compare a lot of this to North American standards. So what we'll do is we're going to take, break up this talk, and we're going to talk about the various issues here. So we'll talk about, we're going to start with source capacity. So that's Chapman Lake to a lot of people. To some people, it's, it's the wells within your small systems. Okay. And it also includes um, the two other lakes for Egmont and Cove Cay. Uh, well, then we'll talk about treatment capacity. Okay, So that's the water treatment plant. The other issue is transmission main. So what happens is once you actually get past the water treatment plant, you need to push the water across your system. So that, that is conveyance with your transmission main. So we actually break that out as a separate component. So conveyance, and you, what your system is doing is you're actually trying to push the water up to your reservoirs. So these are the tanks at various portions throughout the system, okay? So that's reservoir capacity. And then what happens is you get to the reservoirs and then you drop into your distribution system. Is that clear? So th these are the components we'll be looking at and talking about. Um, 
<clears throat> and we'll try to keep it up in here so you can try to follow along. So, source capacity. <clears throat> so, Chapman Lake. The, the issue with Chapman Lake is to do with drought risk. Okay, so the municipal or provincial standard for drought risk is, is a 1 in 25 year drought. That's typical. Right now in Chapman, you're running with a 1 in 21 year drought risk. And that drops. <clears throat> when you go to existing demand management in 2036, you're in a 1 in 11 year event. And even with intensive demand management, you're in a 1 in, one in 15 year event. So what that means is the, the reoccurrence of that drought will get worse and worse over time. Okay, so the probability, the risk of you running into that will get worse. I mean, it was really bad. This, the, your last um, water restriction, you, your lake levels were so low that you almost ran out of water. And we'll talk a little bit about what that meant. It's not that the lake actually ran out of water, it's the lake drops below the outlet. Okay? So what happens at Chapman is you can get water up to that outlet level. And once it drops below the outlet level, you don't have the ability to get water into the creek, which provides you water at the treatment plant. So that's the issue. And we'll talk about some of the options. <coughs> So we looked at three options in 2007. So some of you know, I know we talked about it earlier, it's a floating pump station. So what is a floating pump station? A floating pump station basically gives you access to the rest of the lake. Okay, so you're only using 20% of the lake right now because of the elevation of the outlet. So floating pump station, what it would effectively do is give you access to lower volumes within that same water source. Okay, so that's just one option. And so what we're saying here though is it's a floating pump station or alternative access to lower lake to lower lake reaches. So there are other options. There's been comments of can we drill a lower intake? That's an option we're looking at. Okay? So this is the short term recommendation that we have for the region. Uh, we also looked at an engineered lake. So what that was is that was a quarry pit. We've got quarries within the region and to try to utilize one of the quarries once it's been abandoned. Okay, so that's an engineered lake. The third option we looked at was raising Chapman Lake. The issue with raising Chapman Lake is there's a lot of environmental impacts. So although it's cheaper than capital costs as opposed to engineered lake, it has a significant environmental impact that the regional district didn't feel was uh, appropriate and they didn't, they didn't want to um, go further down that option. So I should mention also that there's an interesting like uh, the other recommendation was to actually look at potential for groundwater. So that was a recommendation um, to do groundwater testing. Okay. And, and we have not done detailed groundwater analysis. Um, but what you can see from the, the groundwater that you actually have within the region, there's actually not that much capacity other than the, some of the wells closer to Gibson's. But then again, the, the concern with getting closer to Gibson's is trying into their aquifer um, and affecting some of their results. <clears throat> so when we looked at the two options, so engineering lake, um, with existing demand management versus intensive demand management, um, there's a savings of about 3.25 million if you went to intensive demand management. And the flowing pump station, similarly, there's a savings of about $700,000 with intensive demand management. Okay, so we also looked at small source, small <coughs> system source capacity. Uh, there was no drought risk analysis carried out. Um, a lot of these small sources are, are wells, and it's, it's, it is challenging to do drought risk analysis on well systems. So the data was not available, we did not conduct drought analysis for them. Uh, we found that the source capacity of these systems are able to meet 2011 demands. 
uh, with the exception of the Eastbourne Wells. So the Eastbourne Wells are known to have limited capacity, and so we recommend a groundwater investigation program to find additional wells. Okay, so the next item here is we're going to look at the water treatment plant. So the water treatment plant has to provide water for maximum day demands. And the reason is, is you need to be able to push maximum day demands out to your reservoirs. And you need to have your reservoirs in your system refill over a 24 hour period. If they don't refill over a 24 hour period, what will happen is those tanks start to reduce the levels over subsequent days. Okay, so you'll have a gradual decline within your system. So that's why when we design treatment plants, we design for maximum day demand. Okay? <coughs> the Chapman treatment plant has reached capacity. The capacity of the plant is about 25 megaliters per day. We're currently running in excess of 25 megaliters per day. And so what we're saying is you need to do upgrades. If you do nothing, if you continue on with the same demand management program, you'll need to do immediate upgrades to your plant. <clears throat> what we're saying is if, if you did intensive demand management, brought your per capita rates down, you could delay plant expansion to about 2020. And so that just brings your per capita rates down and you extend the life of the existing plant. Okay? And then what you'd have to do in the, in the meantime is you'd have to actually um, work with a higher risk and, and potential for stage three um, water restrictions during that period. Okay, so here's some costs. The existing demand management plant, demand management, the treatment plant capacity, ultimate requirement is about 45 megaliters per day. Capital cost is about 10 million. Intensive demand management, treatment plant capacity about 37 and a half megaliters per day. Capital cost about 6.4 million. Okay, small systems. Uh, so the treatment capacity, treatment technologies for the very small systems are considered accurate, adequate. Treatment capacities are able to meet 2011 demands and are actually able to, make, to meet 2036 maximum day demands. So there was no real issue with the very small systems with the exception again of the Eastbourne Wells. Which we're saying that if you expand, expansion of treatment at Eastbourne Wells are required if you, if, you make, if you develop more additional wells. Okay, and then you also recommend automation of chlorination at Solms Point Well. Uh, we've also recommend complete source to tap assessments and well protection programs. <coughs> okay, so the next item after water treatment, so it's the source going to your water treatment plant and then transmission mains. So, as I discussed earlier, so you have to have the ability to um, the system to refill reservoirs over a 24 hour period during maximum day demand. So, the transmission mains have to be adequately sized, are adequately sized for 2011, but you need upgrades in 2036. And the upgrades are significant depending on the scenario. Okay, so transmission mains, what, what, what the issue is, it's like taking a shower at your house. If somebody else starts using water, the pressure drops. That's exactly what happens in your system. Is you'll, you'll, and your system, because it's long and skinny, is quite sensitive to demand increases. So, here is your current 2011 system. So you've got reservoirs to the east, which is Reed Road, and Sem and cemetery, and you got <coughs> reservoirs to the west, which is Secret Cove. So the goal of the whole system is to provide water to those reservoirs. And then you see here the pressure going up, and that's it's because you've got pump stations at Roberts Creek. So you've got a pump station that boosts in line. What happens is, if you get to 2035, existing management, is you can't fill the reservoirs. 
And that, that issue becomes significant. So the only way to really address the issue, it's like having a hose. You have to get a bigger hose to reduce that head loss or build or increase the capacity of your pump stations. So, you know, we're talking Reed Road to the east and I believe Coletta to the west. So here's Coletta Station, there's, a, there's the Roberts Creek pump station, sorry, not Reed Road, Roberts Creek. And the costs are significant. Because the system's so sensitive to this pushing water out on those long skinny pipes, with existing demand management, the cost is about 7.5 million. With intensive demand management, it's about 2.1 million. Okay, so the savings is about 5.5 million in the two various scenarios. Okay, the next component to look at here is the reservoir capacity. So when we push the water out to reservoirs, the tanks in your system. Um, so the reservoirs really need to have the ability to balance and optimize supply and deliver the water to your end users. So what this means is your system's demand for peak day, maximum day supply to your system. But you actually exceed maximum day supply in your system for portions of it. So the reservoirs balance that. So you get water from the treatment plant and the reservoirs to balance when you exceed maximum day demand. So it's balancing storage and also fight fires. So when you have a fire in your fire demand within your system, a lot of it will come from your reservoirs. Okay, so those are two driving criteria for reservoirs. So you do have a significant reservoir, it's right at the treatment plant, and you have a lot of redundancy, redundancy with that clear well. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details, but you, you save about 1.5 million under the two scenarios. There's existing versus intensive demand management site so reservoirs. Okay, we also looked at small systems reservoirs. So we found that the current reservoir capacities are adequate to provide balancing fire storage. Uh, the future fire storage deficiencies, deficiencies occur in Langdale, Psalms Point, and Grantham's landing systems, but can be managed with the interconnection to the Chapman supply. So it's because you've got interconnection to Chapman, um, you can actually um, use that Chapman supply to back up. But we do have some recommendations, and it's really to make that interconnection between the systems more robust. So that was one of our recommendations. Okay, so the last component of the system is distribution system. So this is when you actually get to the residence. Um, you're looking at the sizing of the mains. Um, so what we're trying to look at a lot of times is looking at pressure requirements. So we want to maintain, maintain a, at least 40 PSI during maximum day demand and 20 PSI, uh, maximum, 20 PSI during fire flow events. Okay, so the 40, 40 PSI is really a service issue. If you go down below 40 PSI, what you'll find is you'll find a lot of uh, complaints from residents with low pressure. Uh, the 20 PSI for fire flow, um, that's a backflow issue. Um, it's just really a technical term, but you just don't want to have um, some issues occur if you can't maintain the 20 PSI from your system. We did. We did actually looked at two scenarios for fire flow requirements. Um, we looked at 60 liters per second for fire flow requirements uh, in your entire system, and we also looked at 60 liters per second in urban areas, and an allowance for 30 liters per second in rural areas. So that rural requirement is is quite often used within BC. Um, what we found was if you actually tried to to improve your entire system to 60 liters per second there would be an additional capital cost of about $7 million. So I'm not going to get into all these details, but here's some of the distribution system upgrades to the west. I think there's a board in the back. Uh, here's distribution upgrades to the east. Um, there's not significant savings with the two programs. There's some. Um, so you're looking at about 10.5 million under existing demand management and about 9.6 million under intensive demand management. Savings is about 900,000. So we also looked at the maximum serviceable areas. Oh, they didn't come on. 
it's like you can't see very well back there, can you? Huh. <coughs> okay. Yeah, it's kind of weird. No, it's just a ball. Okay, so you can't quite see, but that's fine. <coughs> what it is is your system has a certain um, energy within the wire system. Okay, so as you go up the hill in a system in elevation, your pressure will drop. It's inherent to the way water systems operate. Okay, so if you're within a certain area and you go up a hill, the pressure will drop, and vice versa. If you go down the hill, the pressure will go up. So in your existing system, you, only, you can only actually reach to a certain elevation. And that's what this map is showing. It's, it's the existing current maximum serviceable area. So these are the areas, if you look at your current water system, that's the maximum elevation for development. So this is to the west, and this is to the east. Okay, and then we also looked at some small system distribution upgrades. Um, so we didn't find any savings between the two programs. They're both the same, but about $900,000 in both. So it's here and here. Okay, so this slide here is just summarizing the cost comparison between existing demand management and intensive demand management. So if you total all the various items for existing demand management, you come to about 43 million. And under intensive demand management, you're about 36 million. So a cost difference of about $7 million. So the demand management program um, also follows your strategic um, sustainability policies within the district. The you know, sustainability policies that include 33% reduction in water demands by 2020. And it's also um, reiterated by the cost savings with the, the intensive demand management program. Okay, so project timeline and budget. So the preliminary 10-year capital plan has been prepared. Um, timeline will be finalized uh, as financial plan and business plans are prepared. So the next steps. So May 15th, the public feedback period closes. June 6th, the consultation report to SRD Infrastructure Committee, ISC. Uh, in June, sometime in 2013, incorporate feedback into the CRWP, which is the plan. July 4th, to finalize the CRWP to ISC for adoption. July to August, prepare business and financial plans. In September, present financial plans and rate structure to the Infrastructure Services Committee. And that's it. So if you have any questions, I know that was a lot to digest in that short period of time. Why do you think that our consumption is so much higher than any other area? Uh, there could be a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the first ones is because we're not metered, so a lot of people don't know if they're a high consumer or a low consumer. I think a lot of it has to do with leakage in, in the system, and I'm not saying necessarily leakage in the water mains that go up and down the roads, but possibly what they find is there's a lot of leakage in the connections from the water main to the home that people just aren't aware of. Um, there can be a number of reasons. Uh, so people would have to pay for that on the meter? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, basically, there will be a capital cost to put those meters in. Um, but over the 25 year time frame, we're saying it's still cheaper to do the dem intensive demand management. And intensive demand management is the biggest component of that is a metering program. So we're saying that it's still going to, even though it's going to cost more money up front, it's going to save you money in the long run. So it's uh, not necessarily going to cost you any more money. And the rate structure, until we did, uh, well first, we got to we got to nail down this strategy. What are we going to be doing? Uh, are we going to do the metering program, which will help us delay the construction of our treatment plant? 
and are we going to look at a floating pump station to deal with our, our uh, increasing drought risks uh, until we build an engineer lake? So these are the questions that we're asking right now. What's a voluntary metering? Voluntary metering is you don't have, it's not universal metering. Basically, if you want a meter, we'll, we'll install a meter. And uh, based on the uh, uh, other examples, other municipalities, it isn't very successful because usually it's just the people that are already low water consumers will subscribe to that. So uh, you're not metering the high consumers and those are the people that you want to identify and, and try to get some messaging out that, hey, you're a high water consumer, um, these are ways that you get consumption down. So yeah, they haven't found very much success with voluntary metering programs just because it's the converted that, are, that sign up for it. Um, what I noticed is um, <clears throat> what's missing for me in the plan is how to use the water we're already using. So um, in some areas of Canada, you have to use gray water. Here the STRD is not big on gray water, and it's really hard to install a gray water system at the moment. Um, so that's one way we could be reusing the water that's currently just going in the ground. Um, and there's things like rainwater harvesting, which right now the SCRD isn't really big on either, because you can do that. Um, there's rainwater systems you can install so that you're flushing your toilets with rainwater and using rainwater and water that's already um, that's already been metered and sure you're not metered, but coming into the house. So what I'd like to see is something bigger that, that looks at that, and there's also education. There are ways to garden that include mulch and a, a something called hugelkultur, which is integrating wood so that holds water more. So I think there's a lot more things that can be done before we meter through education and looking at how we're building and what's happening with our wastewater. Because right now I'm not seeing any of that in this plan. Like it's, it's, it's just not there. And there's a lot of water that just goes into the ground and set the fields and it's just gone. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we looked at how we use our wastewater and, and reclaiming that, it could actually save a lot of water in the water. Yeah, and we are trying to do as much as we can on the education and outreach uh, component of it. And we do promote rainwater harvesting. Uh, we encourage alternative uh, water uses, but we're not at the point where we can regulate it. Um, and I know the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association put an awesome rainwater harvesting manual together, and we are promoting that. Um, but as far as funding, we, we have funded a, a toilet rebate program, uh, basically a bathroom fixture replacement <coughs> program, which was fairly expensive. Uh, we've seen results, but not the results we would see if we did a metering program. And we've, we've had that discussion at the board level. Um, where should we be putting that money? The, the bathroom fixture replacement program has ended. Um, we've got, we still have a toilet replacement program, but not the bathroom fixture replacement program. And we find that um, rather than funding rainwater harvesting programs and things like that, we want to do the metering first. Uh, it's, it raises the awareness levels considerably with the consumers. Right now, a lot of people uh, think they're low water consumers, but they, they, they might not be until you have that data and present that data to you. And you might consume a, lot of, a very low amount of water in the house, and you might have a leak that you're totally unaware of. Um, and that's what we find with a lot of the acreage properties. They might have leaks in, in their supply lines. So, um, without, we think that the metering is the primary tool. And then once you have that tool in place, you'll be able to raise the awareness and start uh, educating those that, that, that are high water consumers. So we want to get that in place and first, but we're not saying we're not going to do the harvesting. And I know that uh, the province is looking at um, uh, rainwater harvesting and gray water and how they can make that uh, uh, the regulatory framework easier here in the province. Uh, there's a studies going on right now under the Drink Water Protection Act. So, Excuse me. Uh, one of your earlier PowerPoint uh, slides, and I guess this is a, a question to uh, Dave Knight, you had pointed out a, a spike for Delta region, and I believe you said the uh, part of the reason was intensive agriculture. Mm -hmm. Now, what about HSPP here on the Sunshine Coast? They must be a huge consumer of water. 
Are they independent, completely from us? They're completely independent. Yeah. Okay, so now, if, if that's the case, do, does that slew the, um, that graphic in any way? I mean, HSVP is a form of industrial user, right? So, it's magnifying, in fact, is it not? Where, uh, no, they're, they're totally, uh, all the data and the comparables we use is just people that are, uh, what's connected to the municipal water supply system. So, how some pulp and paper is they're right totally right independent. Right. They, they draw their water from Rainy River and are totally independent. So, they don't factor into the, uh, the data at all. Yeah, well, no. yeah. Yeah. This, this plan is focused on water quantity and not water quality, or are you taking both into consideration? Could you repeat the question, please? Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, this this uh, uh, report is more focused on water quantity versus water quality, and uh, the treatment slides are focused on water quality. Um, so we, we your gene had the kind of the, the top-down structure of the source, which is supply, the lakes and the wells, and then treatment, which is to address water quality. Okay, so, so, so two questions then. You, did you look at what the water quality implications would be if you put a, a pump on in the middle of the lake? Like whether that would change the water quality that you're drawing out of the lake? Um, no, it, it, it won't, it won't yeah. impact the quality of the lake. And then there was something in there about well water protection zones. Is that something that's going to be looked at or is that something that's going to be later? And that's more of an operational. Um, program and it's to do well head protection just to make sure that there's no uh, the means to, that any any path that can contaminate your well will be uh, will be uh, uh, attended to. Yeah. And so it's more of a uh, more of a paper exercise. Yeah. So it is part and of it the is part recommended for yeah. for the small water systems. Okay. Yes. David, Brian, I was just wondering, in the study that you did, was there when, when I compare it to Nanaimo and Vancouver Delta, whatever else, I would suspect myself that those areas would have a higher industrial and commercial use of water than residential, or that on a, on a if you look at the total, compared to the Sunshine Coast, I would think ours is very high on the residential because we don't have a big industrial or commercial base. And I'm just curious if you, if that is true, does that mean that our consumption compared to those other areas is even higher because we're residential as opposed to industrial and commercial? And do you know if these, those numbers did include the industrial? I, I they don't did, yeah. They did? Yeah. Of the other uh, local governments? Yeah. So. And in general, yes, I think uh, when you take out industrial, well, the ICI, industrial, commercial, and institutional, I think it'll make our system worse, definitely, because we are predominantly residential based. As a follow-up to that question, just curious as to, because our population fluctuates quite a bit in the summer, like up to half of all homes in the Sunshine Coast are recreational, um, and they would be here in the summer, so I'm wondering if that's taken into account with per capita, like what the population amount is for a winter and for a maximum demand kind of day, which would be, we would have, we might have twice as many people here visiting, staying just for the summer. Yeah, no, it doesn't account for the seasonal variation. Population. Um, no, but when we when we look at the recommendations, we're comparing. That's just to present kind of comparables between communities. But all the uh, data is based on consumption and the number um, of connections. Per capita. No, it's mm -hmm. actually based on total consumption. Total consumption. And um, and but the comparables are based on per capita. So um, just to give you the comparables between the communities. Mm -hmm. right. But uh, when we're looking at recommendations to upgrade and our capacity is based on actual volumes and uh, per, uh, per connection is, we like to do per connection uh, comparison, but the other municipalities, that data is not available from the other municipalities, so that's why we have to do it that way. But if we do, our consumption goes double in the summertime. As does our population, that makes yeah. sense. So <laughs> yes. population goes up plus, yeah. plus it's, it's yeah, the one thing that we, we, when we looked at the potential demand reductions is we looked at that stage two. When, when you actually went to a stage two and you get 20% reduction in demands, it's, it's quite significant. 
So, I mean, regardless of your population change, it, there's it's high water usage within the region. Um, one thing I didn't talk about is <clears throat> the stage two water restriction here is, is your nighttime usage only. If you look at other municipalities, um, say Metro Vancouver, their stage one is morning only. So, I mean, their stage one is probably more restrictive than your stage two. Because they're looking at, I think it's water usage between, water sprinkling between 4, um, four and 7 a.m. or something like that. 4 and 9. 4 and 9. Okay, so, I mean, it, it becomes more um, restrictive in terms of you know, getting out to go out and water your lawn. But it is an issue. Um, in Metro Vancouver, what they did is they actually had water usage, their stage one was at nighttime. And they found, I believe it was a 12 or 14 percent reduction when they switched from night usage to morning usage. So that's one of the reasons why they did it. But regardless, it's, it's, it's more restrictive. And the there whole plan is. less water use with the morning water time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the population used less water when they went to that change. Okay, so it's, it's just, it's, it's one of the issues that you have. Um, but that's, a, that's one of the um, other points within the intensive demand management program is to look at some of your other options in managing your water usage. Yeah, and we are going to be doing a uh, questionnaire uh, in, the, in the next few weeks on, on our grow management plan and asking questions on, um, on actually increasing the restrictions and maybe following the, the uh, Metro Vancouver model. Uh, and I know there's a lot of gardeners that don't like the evening only. They prefer yeah. to have the morning. Definitely. Just, so we're going to be uh, in parallel with this, ask, asking those questions. Excellent. I'll take one from the back. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the presentation seems to be geared towards reducing the consumption of the existing residents. And yet, as you drive around the coast, you find areas designated for uh, 200 units, 29 units here, 50 some odd units there. So if you are continuing to develop and bring more and more people into the system, the usage has got the <coughs> existing users get even less, and everybody gets there even less. And, and so I think that part of the focus as well as education and everything else, has to be increasing the reservoirs or redeveloping the sources so that there, we have more water to utilize. Or else we're going to have people moving to the coast saying, I came here and I can't even have a bath. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, I think we've got to look at what we're doing in the way of development vis-a-vis what, our, what is our water capacity? Yeah, and you'll see that that last conclusion, that conclusion slide that showed all the recommendations and tallied them up. Um, so the conservation is a huge component of it, but there's also is the floating pump station or alternative, which would, because Chapman Lake, we can only access the top 10 feet of the lake, there's still 120 feet of water underneath that and we just don't have access to it. So when I told people that you know we're running out of water, they had expected to see when we did an aerial shot of the lake to be, for it to be dry. But it looks like a full lake, pretty much. Um, so we need to get access to that uh, lower reaches of the lake, and that's one of the recommendations as well. But that's just an interim measure. We don't want to have to do that on a regular basis. We just want to have to do that during the severe drought periods. Um, <coughs> And the ultimate is to do the engineer lake in the, in, um, in the Con Ag lands. Uh, an already mined out area that you could build a man made lake and store additional water in the wintertime when it's overflowing uh, the dam and it's not needed for fishery values or anything. Store that and draw that in the summertime. And, but on the land use side of things, it's our official community <coughs> plans which uh, sets the vision for land use. And our plan, the infrastructure plan, is, is just to follow the, the land use plans, so not the other way around. We don't want to use infrastructure to dictate land use. We want the land use plans to dictate our infrastructure. So we are using a combination of all three. So 
we're not just putting everything into demand management, but there is there is a lot of room to cons to conserve without impacting our lifestyles. We are we are pretty high water consumers in general. I have a question regarding the water meter. Um, if you were to, if, if the community was to go for a full water meter, what are, what are you expecting in terms of a drop of water consumption just by metering? That, to to yeah. me, that's what I'm getting out of that. It's just by people seeing what they're using as they will voluntarily cut yeah. that. Yeah, based on uh, examples from other communities, they say uh, you should be able to realize 20%. Just like that, just by putting metering, just by raising the awareness of the, uh, the water users. And on top of that, with the leakage that you'll find, and I gave an example in Seashell where we just commissioned a brand new water system in Avon. And we just connected everybody in. And we saw our first meter read, and the, the water volume were high. We were holy, they're consuming a lot of water. And then we found from looking at the individual connections, one house, one connection was consuming half the water in the community through a leak. So that's what you can find just through metering, you can find these major leaks. And uh, so we're hoping 20% is on the low side and we'll realize higher things than that. Will universal metering help you track leaks in your own system? It will. Yeah, definitely. Well, you could do, depending on how you do your data crunching, you could, do, you could break it up into zones as well. And, and just analyze the various zones in your system uh, through through universal metering. Um, so you do neighborhood by neighborhood. There's, you guys have been offering <laughs> meters in the town of Gibson, so um, hopefully you've been able to find a lot of uh, leakage in your system through that. But what we're, we're thinking that most of the leakage is more than likely in the uh, on the service connection side of things. Are the meters uh, going to be smart meters, <laughs> or are they going to be dead? Uh, that the technology hasn't been decided yet. <coughs> um, up in North and South Pender, we are doing a universal metering program there, and it has been decided to go to radio frequency meters. Mm -hmm. um, radio frequency. So, not necessarily DC hydro type smart meters, um, but they are radio rate meters. And um, we just walk by with a scanner. Yeah, you drive by, uh, and, and there's different technologies in the water it's system. It's not sending out a signal. There are some that do send out a signal. One thing to consider, though, is that uh, radio frequency on the water side, there will be a property line. They won't, they won't be in your home. And there's different, and on the water, and again, we haven't decided the technology. I'm just saying for North and South Pender, yes. Uh, the board has decided to go with uh, radio read meters. Again, the actual technology will depend on when we go to tender in, in North and South Tender. So, and uh, we haven't designed the rate structure or anything, um, whether there's going to be an opt-out provision. And but these are things that we'd, uh, we'd have to consider, um, having an opt-out provision as well. Yeah, we're not going to do it first and then ask second. <laughs> Um, and it's back there. Is that me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about um, how the water meters help us individually know what's going on within our system. Because I live in Gibsons, I, we just got our, our last bill, and my water consumption doubled. And it, I didn't use twice as much water. I mean, I absolutely know I didn't use twice as much water. If anything, I've been trying to use less. So if there's a leak somewhere, I would really like to find it. But knowing that I've doubled my water consumption isn't helping me figure out what to do about it. So how does that work? Other than I just pay for twice as much water that I clearly didn't get any benefit from. It's doubled since you put the meter in? Since last year. And you had meter last year? Yeah. Well, hopefully it got you thinking on if you did change any behavior at all. Yeah, uh, uh, if anything, I use less. Like, I absolutely know that. I mean, I'm, at, I'm rabid about water use. I actually do use gray water. I haul it out in buckets and use it. So yeah. I know I'm not using more water. You know, I'm not <clears throat> watering stuff. I went around and looked. You know, I don't have leaky taps outside, nothing like that. So. Do, my question is, do the meters in any way help with that? 
or do I just go and pay for lots of water? Good question. The, the smart meters can track that for you. So if you, have a, if, you have a, if you have a smart meter technology, uh, we can come out and, and uh, um, assist in, in finding out if you have a leak or not. If Do you just I have, have smart meter technology? Uh, depends on your address, but uh, feel free to phone us. We, okay. we, we'll send somebody out. I did go down, but... Yeah. This is uh, Dave Newman, he's the director of engineering for Tony Gibson. Oh, you do. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's, and that's one of the advantages of the smart okay. meters is that you can track your water usage. Is there a way for when, when there's a fee structure applied to um, water usage, um, is there a way to um, penalize poor use of water, perhaps like cleaning off a driveway in the middle of the summer instead of using a broom, um, versus growing vegetables, which I think is something we want to encourage as a, as a landscaper and gardener and people and a volunteer who helps encouraging people to grow food in the backyard. I'm, you know, I'm, it's almost, um, it's almost a tax on, you know, we're not taxing candy, we're taxing fruits and vegetables. So I'm wondering how, how we, if there's a way to, to limit that or yeah. to make that less. Well, we, we haven't even started to design a restructure yet. And even if we do go to universal metering, we will follow the town of Gibson's example where we will read the meters for a year before we even set that restructure. So those will be considerations when we start developing that restructure. But there's no way to see what the water is being used for, or yeah, yeah, so, essentially, um, right. yeah, and uh, yeah, the best practices you see they set a flat rate for just to meet your basic needs, mm -hmm. and then there'll be an incline rate after that. And the fact is, it costs money to deliver water, mm -hmm. and especially water in summer. That's the most expensive water mm -hmm. and the most valuable water. That's our, we have to design our water systems to meet that maximum day, mm -hmm. and that maximum day is in the summer. So that's mm -hmm. the most expensive water. So, but those things, I know, and I know through our agriculture plan um, uh, advisory committee, uh, we are, the SRD is really trying to encourage agriculture, but yeah, it's competing. You could competing. discourage it at the same, and the same, the other hand. Yeah. <clears throat> Ideally, use. Don't use potable water. Don't use don't use municipal water for your gardens. That would be an ideal situation. Uh, in the um, I think it was back on the lake. Sorry. Sorry, I think it was. I'm a, I'm a scan right to the left. I'll, I'll get. I'll get you. What do you consider high quality water? That what do I consider high quality water? First of all, can I ask you, are you working for the regional district? Yes. Do you work for? Um, I'm the I'm with the regional district. High quality water mm -hmm. is water basically that meets the Canadian drinking water guidelines. And is it chlorinated every and every high Every water quality? system in the regional district system is chlorinated. The How town of Gibson's don't chlorinate their system. How frequently? Pardon? How frequently? How frequently? Yeah. It's it's continuous. I mean we have to meet a certain residual uh, chlorine um, uh, limit in, in our system. And so if you were in So in the Chapman Creek water reservoir, there is constantly a sort of like a drip flow of chlorine. Yes. And I'm asking. Yes. So it's not in the reservoir itself. No, it's not in the reservoir itself. But in, in our in our system, we have to maintain chlorine residuals so that the bacteria doesn't regrow in the system. Do you know to what percent? How do you measure that? Yeah, we do measure our chlorine residuals. Uh, what do we try to maintain? Point, point two, two. two. Yeah. milligrams. Point part per million. Per liter, and in the in the tail end of our system. So, That's the lowest amount. And this is uh, a requirement through. What is the highest amount? What do we inject at? It all depends on the distance between where we inject the chlorine to the tail end of the system. So that that will vary. Depending on which direction you're headed. But in general, because we have, on Chapman especially, because we have a filtration plant, we're very fortunate that uh, we can keep our chlorine uh, dosage to the absolute minimum. So without the filtration plant, we'd have to have a higher chlorine. Um, so 
So when you go to a lot of uh, other communities, uh, you'll notice that their chlorine is much more noticeable than. I can smell it. Certain days I can smell it more than other days coming out of the hose. The very Hopkins landing Sorry. is not chlorinated. Pardon me? The system at Hopkins landing is not chlorinated. I'm not familiar with the Hopkins system. So it's that was not yet. Not yet. And the town of Gibson is third or uh, two crushes on some kind of music. So, yeah. what does that mean when you said Hopkins, Soames, and Granthams are independent but they're interconnected? Uh, we can provide water to Hopkins through, through uh, closed valves. Right now, it's closed. But if, if there is a fire and, and they run out of water, we could actually supply Hopkins with water to fight a fire. What but we would only do that on an emergency basis. What about Soames? The same as Soames. Yeah. So they're not chlorinated either? No, Soames is chlorinated. Yeah. Oh, because there was a recommendation for automatic chlorination? Yeah, it's, it's a manual dose. We, we manually dose uh, uh, Soames right now. So we, we, uh, the drinking water officer wants us to automate it, so that it's uh, uh, more fail safe. How often do you put the uh, As often as we need to maintain the residual. Is it got fluoride in it? We don't uh, inject fluoride into any of our water systems. <laughs> I think back in the late 90s, the idea of a floating pump station in the lake was brought forward to the public. And there was quite a concern about the idea of a pump that would be powered by a diesel generator so close to the actual source of water. Has that scenario changed at all? And I understand it's only to be used in the most dire uh, situations like last fall. But has that situation changed at all? Or are we still looking at a diesel-powered pump? I know that we're looking at a propane-powered pump, uh, not, not diesel. So uh, I guess that is a change from, yeah, the, the floating pump station plan was uh, vetted through the community back in 1999. So, um, and, uh, and we managed to, through operating uh, changes, we managed to basically weather the storm, basically. And by last year, we had a drought. We sure wish we had a, a pump station up there last year. You, we didn't actually have to use it, but we were within days of having to use it. Is that correct? Uh, we were having to manipulate that system. We were watching that system by the hour and flying up there. So um, it was really challenging. We were actually, re because we're, we're, we release water for fish, and we were actually releasing more water for fish than we were for human consumption. So it was, it was really challenging, and uh, our really, uh, the, the operators were incredible at basically squeaking every inch of water out of that system. So would that be the one in 25 year drought that we experienced last year? That was the worst drought on record, so going 110 years back, I think. So would it be? Um, how, when did the next time that that kind of situation arise? Uh, statistics is, statistics is crazy. It's, uh, well, it should be in another 100 years, but it could happen next year. So with climate change, it's possible it could happen. And with climate change, climate variability, it's just going to get worse. Uh, the droughts are expected to be longer. And, uh, and but we're still forcing we're going to get a lot of rainfall in the wintertime. So um, it's a matter of storage. So what's actually going to change then with this idea of the floating pump station? The idea that's going to be used more frequently? Uh, because of the as the uh, yeah, as as uh, as the droughts get get more severe, we would have to use it more often. But again, it's an, we're just proposing it as an interim measure until we can get the man-made lake. Man-made lake will be the ultimate. So until this the floating pump station be interim, just to get us through the drill periods over the next little while. We're also hoping that conservation uh, through the medium program. If, if we do realize 20% gain, that, that'll be 10 years worth of growth. If we don't have the growth, that, that, could, uh, that could be it. Uh, we should be, it might be, a, yeah, be fine just through, just through conservation measures. So, but uh, 
the floating pump station versus the risk of flying pumps up to the lake on an emergency basis, which we almost did. We were days away from calling the pump people. The risk of having a purposely built pump station that has all the safety measures in place is a lot less than flying something up there on an emergency basis. So um, we did not want to fly pumps up there just because of the risk. But between that and running out of water, um, so the plan is what, what you're asking for in the plan is to actually build a permanent station there. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And which wouldn't be utilized once the manual lake is, 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 is constructed. And hopefully for paint power. <laughs> and yeah, we're not proposing diesel. Okay. Perhaps more of a political question, uh, and maybe even two step. Why are we not just implementing restrictions? every year, even if we've got lots of water. This would force, I mean, you're, you're talking to the converted here already, but for those that are not, you would force the community as a whole to quit washing their cars, to quit greening their lawns in the middle of the summer. I mean, I, given the restricted resources that we have, it's only common sense. And that's not so common anymore. So rather than selling hardware in the form of meters, which I understand would be very useful to track leaks, could, could the SCRD not install more meters throughout their branch networks on, on your dime to try to track areas that are real high consumers and take it from there on the hardware side? But on the political side and the educational side, put the darn restrictions in. Who needs a green lawn in the middle of August, given our global situation and our regional situation? Yeah. And, and I mentioned that we're going to be doing a uh, review of our drought uh, management plan and the increased levels of restrictions. And we are going to have a, uh, a questionnaire uh, asking basically the community on how you feel about increased restrictions. So we're hoping to get that feedback. Is, is that, that a mail up? Or uh, it's going to be. It's going to be online. It's going to be online. Okay. First, so. we're thinking for next year. That's right. that's so implementing those measures next year. Yeah. I, I really feel that's a lot of the answers. So, just um, implementation. Say, hey, you're, you're not going to wash your car. You're not going to water your lawn in August. Yeah. I, I'm more in line with the lady over here. You, you know, vegetables are more important. And uh, washing your car, hoods on up. Your yeah, we had we had the same comments in the seashell, and there's uh, there's a few people there that just said, you know, cosmetic water, you just get rid of it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, first, we want to hear what everybody else thinks as well before we uh, uh, pulls that. But the big hardware itself, the big hardware. I don't get it. Yeah. Do you have any idea how many people that live on the coast permanently that are not hooked up? To uh, we haven't quantified it yet, but there's a number of properties in Upper Roberts Creek, a number of properties in, in West Seashed area, and there's some in, in, in higher in the Half Moon Bay area there. So there are quite a few. We haven't quantified it yet, and I've been asked to quantify that, so I will be looking at the number of properties that aren't on regional water. It would be an interesting uh, estimate. Yeah. So, and there's, there's I, I know speaking, speaking to a lot of people that aren't on regional waters, Aren't, aren't are on their own private system. A lot of them prefer to be like that, and, and there's also those that say, oh, I wish I had regional water. So, um, and again, it's a land use, it's a land use question. You know, I'm waiting, I, I won't build infrastructure, say I put a pump station and a reservoir to service up around the street. We want to have a land use decision first, because it will create growth pressures. If, as soon as you put water, uh, municipal water system into an area that's going to be pressure for growth. So, well, if it's already maxed out, if the population that's there now is already utilizing what's available and then some, then apparently there isn't room for growth. No, is what that would say to me. So, but we have a plan here that's presenting 25 years at 10 percent. So we're looking at you know over 15 percent uh, increase in capacity over the next 25 years. Is there any uh, consideration about this overconsumption of water with 
old antiquated service pipes because we've sure got one. I used I phoned, we've been there 25 years. 20 years ago they'd say, oh, it's in the budget next year. I finally gave up on my phone. I've given up and it's never, it's an old asbestos pipe. It's sprung leaks many times. Uh, we, we do, uh, to the tune of about 700000 bucks a year, uh, mains replacement program. And basically, asbestos cement is our number one uh, targeted um, pipe. Should I start phoning again? So, uh, we do have a program. <laughs> We're just getting... Uh, we do have a program, and it is set on, on a priority basis. And uh, we have been tackling the asbestos cement in the highway first. And I know next year, this year, we're actually going down Pratt Road. So, yeah, definitely let me know. Um, <laughs> yeah. If it's as best as cement, it's on the list, for sure. Uh, a few years ago, walking along Dow Point Road between uh, Pratt and Dow Point and Secret Beach parking lot, I noticed uh, during the dry summer season, uh, four leaks the water came bubbling out of the ground. And I phoned the regional district and uh, they came and looked at it and it was actually leaking the old pipe. But now you can't see it anymore with the uh, shoulder of the road uh, paved over. You see, that the bicycle lane is now down. Yeah, I'm sure there will be more leaks because it's an old pipe. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, we do have a replacement program. And, uh, but you have to tear up the pavement again. Yeah. Get to the pipe. So I'm not sure if, usually if it's a main leak, even with a paved uh, road, you will you will still see evidence of, of leakage. I'm looking for it now, but I doubt it. So why not just replace all the mains to reduce the consumption? Yeah, that was a very expensive. But um, metering will help us target our mains replacement. It will show us areas, neighborhoods of high excessive consumption, so um, yeah, so if we go to putting zone meters in as well, <coughs> and that's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to put zone meters in so you can do mass balancing. You read all the individual uh, meters in the neighborhood, and you look at what's going in, what's going out, and you say, it doesn't balance, something's wrong. <coughs> so, it could be a Measure what's going out, too. Yeah, it's another, we haven't talked about zone metering. But it basically you measure what's going into a community and what's going out. Like our, our, our water mains are in here. And then you can add up all the connections that you can see and what you put into the neighborhood, what's going out of the neighborhood, and see if they match. Yeah, so the, the water meters would, would help you manage your system at the end of the day. So you can you'll be able to determine how much water is going to the residential and you know your commercial uh, users and then if you did the mass balance of these meters, you could actually uh, calculate the unaccounted for or water loss in your system. So it's, it's a management tool as well. So in your case, I mean, if they had a zone meter and they saw this water loss, it's something to investigate. Um, it's part of the strategy of water management. Right, right now, we don't have any data. So the old saying, you can't manage what you can't measure. So metering would definitely help us measure it. Uh, so the, the neater thing, I can't help but wonder in, in relation to the lower mainland, 10 other communities, only really three are metered. What have all those other communities done instead of metering over time to measure their water consumption, water loss through the system versus lower conservation rates, things like that? Do, has, has that been considered or thought about? Um, well, it's going to vary from municipality to municipality. It's also going to vary to what their vision is mm -hmm. and how much they have embraced sustainability. Um, well, I guess coming, because I've come from the Lower Mainland previously and lived in some of those communities where water conservation was big 10, 15 years ago. And um, that those smaller communities did a lot of education, awareness, um, support for that. But meters seem to be more of a more recent tool, I guess, that, that's yeah. being used. Yeah, well, you know, I can't speak for Metro Vancouver, mm -hmm. but they've sunk a lot of money into infrastructure. Okay. 
And um, actually, I had a good conversation with the City of Vancouver's water conservation um, manager. And she really struggles because Metro Vancouver is saying, we got tons of water. And she's, her job is to push the conservation, water conservation program. And she can't tie it to anything. There is, so the there is no, there is no real crunch on their water in, in Metro. It's where it's ours is. Where ours is, yeah. Any more questions? So part of our problem is that the treatment facility is running at capacity already? A uh, number of days we run over capacity, yeah. Number of days per year. Last year we didn't. Does that mean that the water is not treated then if it's running over capacity? No, it means our uh, treatment plant operators are running it too hard. <laughs> yeah. Over redlining. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, red yeah, they're redlining it. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you very much for attending. We, again, we have the storyboards up here. Anybody with a name tag, if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to ask us. We're here until 9. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.